every month we're looking at um, where we're spending that money so that we can provide that full shopping experience um, to our clients. So for sure, the more food that we can get in free of charge, which is what Spoonfuls is doing um, for every agency that they're providing. I mean, zero dollars, yeah, to tons, that point. tons <laughs> of labor. I mean, just tons of really difficult labor. Steve Sherlock there for Franklin Matters, Franklin Public Radio. Anywhere, anytime on the internet, WFBR.FM, and in the local Franklin Mass dial, 102.9. Here today in the Franklin Food Pantry. A glorious place to be because so much is happening, and it's hunger month this month, so... We have our executive director, Tina Potley. Tina, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Steve. Thank you for having us. And we have a special guest with us today. We do. We have Liz Miller of Spoonfuls. Spoonfuls. And we'll find out more about that because that clearly plays into this Hunger Action Month that we're about to discuss. Yes. So take it away. I'm excited. <laughs> well, September is Hunger Action Month. Um, which is a national effort to raise awareness about hunger and inspire action sort of within the community. So the food pantry is trying to take this to heart by doing a number of things during this month, one of which is collaborating with Spoonfuls um, for the public and to raise awareness of the issues um, sur surrounding food insecurity and how those affect other parts of, of our community, our environment, the world at large. Because the food really is almost an ecosystem unto itself, and you're a key piece in part of that. But there are other aspects of that, and that I think is where you play into that realm as well. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and then about Spoonfuls itself? Sure, happy to. So I work at Spoonfuls. I'm the Senior Community Relations Manager there. And our work is ensuring that good food goes to people who can eat it. Uh, we work to ensure that food doesn't go to waste and instead feeds people. So we do that through a direct distribution model through our food recovery program. We work with partners across the state to recover perfectly good food that would be headed to the landfill for one reason or another, but should be feeding people instead. Um, and we deliver that food with our fleet of refrigerated vehicles every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, we work with about 90 retail partners across the state. Um, partners like Whole Foods, Wegmans, Stop and Shop, a lot of the, the grocery stores we all shop at. Um, and we deliver to uh, 194 nonprofit partners. So those partners are reaching about 55,000 clients each week. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is how we operate at Spoonfuls. Right, so a normal shopper, when you walk into the food store, whichever brand it is, there's always kind of the fresh foods. There's a prepared food section as well, and that's especially, I think, one of the focal points you have to recycle food. So our focus actually is on fresh. So on about fresh, period. yes, exactly. Okay. So about seventy percent of what we recover is is fresh, nutrient dense perishable foods, so fruits, vegetables, meat, dairy, eggs, mm -hmm. the things that are hardest to come by for folks trying to make ends meet. Right. Um, we do recover some of the prepared products you'll see in you know, the cut fruit and the sandwiches at the deli counter. Right. Um, we'll recover a, a little bit of everything, but our focus is on fresh. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. and especially on a year-round basis, I know the food pantry has been very good at uh, coordinating neighborhood efforts and You've got a team that does the community garden, which f fulfills a good bunch, but that's also seasonal as to when the garden can grow. Correct. And what Liz is talking about in terms of nutrient-dense, fresh food really underscores a commitment that we have made here at the pantry to provide those foods as sort of a staple of what we have right. here. Right. So in a recent client survey, um, we learned that um, 74% of our 
clients use us as their regular grocery store, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of phenomenal when you really think about it right. um, and difficult. So if you're at the regular grocery store, you sort of always expect there to be bananas. You expect there to be certain staples. And by partnering with Spoonfuls, we're in, we ensure that not only will we have staples like um, perishables, um, produce, meats, dairy, um, but we also have this amazingly rich variety mm -hmm. um, of foods for our clients, which is really, really exciting um, to be able to provide that experience because it speaks to dignity, compassion, equity, and those are all core values of Spoonfuls. Yeah, and I think given the growth, and you can certainly speak to the statistics, because every time I turn around, it seems like the statistics continue <laughs> to change in terms of the growth year over year. Clearly, the new building has helped. People who were not aware before clearly can't miss it now. It is such a glorious facility. But with that increasing demands, you're getting an increasing need for food. And it's also reflecting, I think, the more diversity in the population, which is to the point of having more than just the staples. You've got some other odd items that, well, odd to a certain people, but maybe that's the one that they're looking for. A hundred percent. I mean, you know, one of my favorite pieces of this story of the food pantry and Spoonfuls is that we had um, been sort of following them for quite a long time as they were looking to expand a route that would encompass our service area. And really the second that route opened, we were on board. And um, originally we could only receive about a hundred pounds from Spoonfuls once a week because that's all our building could physically contain the prior building. in the prior building yes. and due to sort of the strategic investment of our commercial walk-in fridges and freezers mm -hmm. expansion of the client's shopping space we are now up to a thousand pounds twice a week so it's an incredible um, improvement in the service that we can provide to our clients but also the other piece of this is um, from a community and environmental perspective, that is hundreds of thousands of pounds that we're keeping out of landfills and getting into the hands of folks mm -hmm. who need it. So it's an incredible win-win. Yeah, and I think from uh, even a community perspective, the state has been taking measures to remove certain things from landfills. So fibers were removed, you can't do mattresses. Food is on the radar in some cases is there, and I know town is making some change uh, efforts to do um, composting so the waste that we have in our own little kitchens can get composted and collected, etc. But your company effectively started seeing this radar and developing a, a, a business model around it to take it and then reposition. Tell us a little bit about that growth, how long you've been the company has been in business. Sure, yeah, so Spoonfuls was founded in 2010, and the first food recovery that was done by Spoonfuls was done by our founder and CEO, Ashley Stanley, with her personal vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, she, she jokes that she showed up at a local grocery store and said, what are you doing with that food, and are you throwing it away? And everybody mm -hmm. was very suspicious, um, but she built a really successful nonprofit through that persistence. Um, you know, that was 14 years ago, that was one car. Now we've got nine routes. Um, and, you know, we're across the state. Our biggest footprint is in Greater Boston, but we're here in the Metro West. We're in Worcester County and we're in Hamden County. Ooh, really expanding. Yeah. Really expanded, yep. And um, you mentioned waste bans, and, and there is an organics waste ban in Massachusetts. That spoonfuls was involved with. Uh, when it was created back in, I think it was 2012. Yeah. Um, and it's really a critical piece to the work that we do. So ensuring that good food doesn't go to a landfill requires that um, businesses who are creating food waste understand that that food waste cannot go to that landfill, that they need to find a way to divert it. And though the state doesn't require food recovery as the way to divert that, mm -hmm. they very much recommend that as much as they can. Um, and we spend a lot of time at Spoonfuls really promoting that waste ban because it's it's really critical for folks who are subject to it to know it, even that it exists and that food recovery is the first best option to ensure food is feeding people and not feeding landfills. But our growth has, has really taken off, n not entirely thanks to that ban, but really just because there's 
need and, and there's demand. There's need and there's more awareness, so it's kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, we're not balancing act, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. Food, yeah, food recovery has really kind of found found its place in the world of, of food insecurity over the, the past decade or so. It's really grown, um, and a lot of people have come to understand. I think there was a time where food recovery was kind of looked down upon. I think people thought, I'm receiving garbage food and I'm better than this. And right. Spoonfuls really works to ensure dignity in what we do and, and source really high quality food through our recovery. Um, and many other organizations are doing the same. And it's come to be understood that in fact, it's perfectly good food. It's food we would feed to our own children. Right. Um, and it's just for one reason or another headed to the garbage can right. um, and it shouldn't be. This food pantry certainly has evolved and I think your stats have shown that a lot of the donations you always have been saying, you know, check the expire by dates, et cetera, et cetera. So the community has gotten more aware of that in terms of the box goods, cans good, et cetera. But this is taken to another level in terms of using the other businesses in Franklin and areas and like Spoonful specifically to provide that goods back to feed our neighbors. It's a really a symbiotic relationship because Every piece of it needs to work really well together, and when it does, it helps every other piece of the puzzle. So like Liz was saying, the, the idea of food salvage being sort of leftover food, I feel like we all work really hard to counter that perception because it's not. I mean, some of this is just personal policies at local businesses about how um, close they want expiration dates on their shelves. Mm -hmm. So it's just sometimes a marketing um, policy of a particular business more than anything else. And one of the benefits of working with an organization as well run and rigorous as Spoonfuls is that it really helps ensure that what we as a pantry are putting out to our community is fresh, um, high quality, really prized expensive food because as you just sort of alluded to um, there's a lot of complicated mechanisms mm -hmm. you're involving board of health there's a lot um, that you have to consider when you're talking about perishable foods yes. and um, you know that's one of the reasons that community members might not realize well-meaning might not realize is behind our inability to say take fresh produce or dairy or frozen foods because we want to ensure that, that that food is as healthy and stable as possible. So when you work with a professional um, organization like Spoonfuls that are monitoring all of that for us, you know, that food walks in that door at 7.30 or 8 in the morning and it's out our door, off our shelves, flying off our shelves by the afternoon. That's why we're lucky enough to receive two um, deliveries a week so that it can see us through the whole mm -hmm. week. Sure, and the volume has, and business has been enough with the throughput and the new facility facilitating that, literally. Um, it's much easier to just take it in, put it out, people take it out and go off and enjoy a good meal. 100%, yes. Yes. Growth potential, you're still looking to get additional businesses, establish additional networks, or with stops within some of the the routes you have? I think it's fair to say all of the above. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a pretty sizable wait list, which means we have a number of nonprofit organizations who are looking to receive donations from us, and we cannot serve them right now because we need to bring on uh, more donations before we can provide right. more. Um, so that means we are always looking for more retail brand partners. Um, we're always looking for more from our existing partners. That's why we talk about that waistband and want to make sure everybody knows they're subject to it. Um, but there's a lot of education involved there as well. And so that's sort of within our existing operations what's going on. But we do see potential for us to bring impact into new communities. We mm -hmm. are actively exploring that at Spoonfuls, looking to where else we can be supportive, um, you know, connecting in new communities and trying to understand the landscape and uh, how our food recovery work could be useful there or if our food recovery work could mm -hmm. be useful there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that we're actively pursuing and you know, I think that there's a lot of food going to waste so we feel there's potential um, you know, throughout Massachusetts and in areas we aren't and more deeply in areas where we are currently yeah, as well. As a relatively frequent shopper 
between the wife and I, either I'll go, she'll go, but when I walk through the aisles, and especially in the fresh section, you see all of this stuff, and yeah, it's not all going to go out. There's another path, and now we know where some of that other path is. That's, that's a little savings. And then speaking of the savings, it clearly we're looking for both donations and time, but financially now with knowing what you're getting, or at least a ballpark of what you're getting, you can spend to fill in those other shelves so that when the clients come through, they can get that kind of full shopping experience. Oh yes, for sure. Another um, point of sort of pride and a, and a core sort of guiding principle for us is that um, at, at the Franklin Food Pantry, on our shelves include um, items such as feminine products, yeah. health and beauty items, diapers, and these are all items that um, you cannot purchase if you're see receiving public assistance right. benefits. And those items are typically very expensive. If you remember, if you have children ever trying to purchase diapers, um, and that's sort of an important thing to have mm -hmm. if you have a little one. <laughs> so um, it just helps folks allocate their dollars or we can allocate our dollars. Um, we're, we're, you know, every month we're looking at um, where we're spending that money so that mm -hmm. we can provide that full shopping experience um, to our clients. So for sure, the more food that we can get in free of charge, which is what Spoonfuls is doing um, for every agency that they're providing. I mean, zero dollars. Yeah, we need to reemphasize that point. <laughs> tons of labor. I mean, just tons of really difficult labor um, comes through our doors. And so that allows us to purchase those things that we find are really important to our clients, but that wouldn't be available right. through Food Rescue. Um, and Steve, if I can, the other really important piece of this is that um, Spoonfuls and the Franklin Food Pantry have been a little bit um, accidentally on a parallel journey in terms of strategic planning. They mm -hmm. just released their most recent strategic plan. We just finished a grant funded process right. um, to develop a new strategic plan for our future. And both of us have made um, a commitment to doing what we do in a way that is sustainable and environmentally friendly and sort of reducing carbon footprint and helping others do the same. Mm -hmm. So the piece of food rescue that's so wonderful is not only are you helping a person, a neighbor, somebody probably that you know, but you're also helping the community at large because the less food that goes into a landfill, the less methane emissions there are. Um, it's just sort of this long-term effect that will far outlast any of us. Mm -hmm. um, right. And that feels like the right thing to be doing for, for our community. So again, to collaborate with an organization like Spoonfuls that has the same priorities and mm -hmm. enables us to um, better um, execute on those priorities is, is wonderful. Yeah. And I, I know, having seen, having shared periodically when needed, your con current needs list changes almost week to week, if not, you know, in some cases day to day, you get a spike on this and it's always a help, and, and right. then the community right. responds. But yeah, especially I think post-pandemic, all the paper goods, period, especially yes. the feminine products, et cetera, those prices have increased and really I haven't started seeing them coming down much yet. Um, and even as grandparents, the diapers are still there. And yeah, those, those diaper prices haven't gone down yet either. Yeah, so it gives us a lot more flexibility. And um, just like Spoonfuls there, um, inventory changes day to day. They have no idea what they're going to get. We don't either. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of work um, and flexibility to be able to respond to the daily changing environment. So being able to count on 2,000 pounds of fresh healthy food um, is quite a luxury. Mm -hmm. And with your partners, do they kind of give you a heads up as to what's coming or you're not quite there, you just show up and take whatever they're giving you? Yeah, it's rarely do we know what exactly will be on the loading dock when we show up. I think I think our team on the road typically has a good sense that, you know, this store typically has a lot of fresh produce and this store typically has a lot of good prepared food items they can predict to some extent um, but yeah it's kind of just a matter of showing up and looking through what's there we will occasionally leave 
things on the dock if we don't have room on the truck you know we'll take the boxes of produce before we take all of the bread for sure. example yeah. um but yeah we don't we don't typically know what we're going to get until we show up and uh we just hope it's good stuff for us mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. likewise folks may have you know kind of the wish list the shopping list but then you go through the store and oh that aisle's empty today or that shelf is empty today but at least in walking through here i don't see empty shelves too often no, no, we do. We do a pretty good job of planning and we um, are absolutely indebted to our community. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have pretty deep partnerships with folks like Spoonfuls and other organizations. We have a whole bunch of food rescue relationships in addition to Spoonfuls that mm -hmm. we pursue right. daily. Um, but really, truly, if it weren't for the community that we live in, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Um, folks are always reaching out, um, and we can talk a little bit about what this looks like, you know, at home, um, or to support spoonfuls or to support the pantry. Um, but really, across the board, the Franklin and the, the greater Metro West community has just been wonderful in supporting in whichever way they can. Um, the idea of putting food on the table for people mm -hmm. who might need it. Yeah, and I think to reinforce that point, there's multiple ways. Certainly, if somebody's got some packaged goods, paper goods, feminine products, you'll take those. You got the purple box, the purple people eater, if I remember. Purple people feeder. Feeder. Yes. yes. Well, it's, it's looking on the other <laughs> side. Yes. Yes. <laughs> purple people feeder. Um, you've got volunteer time because while you've got a small staff, it takes a lot of people to maneuver the goods in, up, around. Etc., and then of course the financials are always welcome in whatever dollar and or frequency of amount. Yes, and if I could spend one second on um, that link, um, we went from about 130, 140 active volunteers, um, and in the last year, while our need went up by over 40 percent, that meant we needed more people to sure. help us execute, um, and now we have well over 400 active volunteers that means people who have walked in this store in the last year and that if you translate to that to a dollar value based on s sort of the independent sector's value of that mm -hmm. um, that's a half a million dollars of um, this community's labor of love um, to provide food they're the folks who help us unload the spoonfuls help us put it on the shelves when those those pounds arrive so mm -hmm. Um, that's a huge way to make an impact, but certainly donating food and probably the best option is donating funds because that gives us the flexibility, as you said, to, to respond to To it. fill in the gaps where Changing what's market. on the shelf, yeah. they're bringing in this, well, we need that. So, yeah. Correct. I think there's an event coming where you're going to talk more in a community forum mm -hmm. um, and similar message, maybe more detail and maybe different questions. Yeah, I mean, I think, so part of what we'll be talking about are the climate impacts of wasted food, mm -hmm. um, which I think, you know, we've been talking at length about sort of the food insecurity impacts, right. and those are, for us, of course, the, the first priority is ensuring we're feeding people, but there's this secondary benefit to food recovery, which is reducing those, the climate impacts of wasted food. It's a massive impact. Mm -hmm. um, 38% of food in the U.S. is wasted every year, and it's believed that that's contributing something like 8% of greenhouse gas emissions total, Ouch. which is massive. Mm -hmm. It's really massive. And so if you think about that and you think about, you know, if we stopped wasting food, suddenly there would be kind of a significant impact on what's going on with our climate. Um, it's kind of hard to look past it. Yeah. Uh, and about half of wasted food in the U.S. is actually occurring at the household level. So that's not where Spoonfuls is working. We're working at the retail level. We're right. working with grocery stores. But you know, we really we have a, a significant uh, portion of our work, or, or a good portion of our work, is in the advocacy space. And we really just want to make sure the issues of kind of the intersection of food insecurity, wasted food, and the climate emergency is really well understood. Mm -hmm. So we want food waste to be reduced broadly. And if half of the food waste in the U.S. is happening at the household level, we want people to understand that because that means every household making a small change can add up to a really pretty significant impact. Um, so we'll dive into some of that in, in our conversation. But I, you know, I think a lot of people ask me, you know, I'll give presentations out in the community and I'll talk about this issue with people. And 
people tend to be shocked. They sort of say, oh my gosh, I can't believe that number. 38% of food in the U.S. is wasted. Mm -hmm. But then the next sentence is almost always, but I'm not really surprised. <laughs> and it's like a really <laughs> interesting thing to dissect because I think yeah. people then start to think about the massive portions they get at restaurants and how sure. they don't finish it. Or they right. think about how much they're putting in their countertop compost bin and they don't finish it. Mm -hmm. and, or they don't finish that at the table and it ends up in the bin. So... You know, I think it's really helpful to talk about the issue and really raise that awareness because it gets people thinking, like, how can I change my habits a little yeah. bit? And small changes can lead to big impacts. So, you know, I think we do what we can in the retail space and mm -hmm. other partners doing food recovery work are working with restaurants and doing food recovery in other ways. But it's really important for individuals to think about the impact that they're having and yes. where they can make an impact. Um, because so. even portion controls, even at the home front, never mm -hmm. mind in the restaurant, but... You know, especially with little kids, I know we tend to do best practice in terms of having a portion, but then giving them a little bit of time on their plate. So at least if they haven't fully play, eaten it and or played with it, <laughs> finished, we still have the rest that can go for later. But mm -hmm. if somebody puts everything on the plate and then the kid is finished, and but they haven't really eaten it all, that's waste. It's waste. Yeah, I know people, we often ask in, in presentations, I'll often ask people like, what's the thing that you waste most? And my answer with as mom of two small kids is a little bit of everything. <laughs> and you know, it doesn't entirely go to waste because the dog cleans up half of it. But you know, we, you know, my husband and I are careful to give ourselves small portions to start because we know we're going to be like finishing what's on mm -hmm. their plates. Finish and, the plates yes. You know, we have good eaters and nonetheless, we waste a little bit of everything. Right. So, you know, there's a, there's a million ways to waste and everybody's got their way that they do the, the most when you really think about it. And so there are different ways you can change your habits, you know, what you buy, kind of shopping with a list and sticking to the list is a really important mm -hmm. one. Don't catch Finally. that special. Oh, just because it's a special. Mm -hmm. Don't yep. catch that. Yep. And I'd add to that, you know, shopping with a list, sticking to a list and not shopping when you're hungry is oh, a really that's, important that's one. That's always key. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, we talked about leftovers. That's a really, um, a really important way to avoid waste is like committing to using your leftovers or mm -hmm. getting creative. Again, if you've got small kids and like leftovers are not allowed in your household, be creative. Disguise those leftovers as something right. new. Right. Um, and the date labels, it's, you know, I, I appreciate that you brought that up because it's um, data says that food waste, uh, that, that date label confusion contributes to something like 7% of the food waste that's happening, mm -hmm. which is also kind of a sizable chunk. So yeah. a lot of folks don't realize that those expiration dates, quote unquote, aren't really expiration dates right. and that they well, rarely have anything to do with The labeling has a variety of terminology and each mm -hmm. has its own. We probably should do a separate episode just on that because some of them are best buy, some of them are sell buy, some of them are yeah. fresh buy. It's Use like buy. <laughs> Yeah, my, my personal favorite, enjoy buy. Like, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and there, there's actually legislation. We, what's one of our advocacy priorities is really pushing for legislation. There's some at the at the state level, but what we really need is federal regulation around that, yeah. um, because there's a patchwork of regulations, if any, right now. But food moves across state, state lines, lines very so it doesn't make sense to yeah. have this patchwork of regulations that are typically not based in science. Mm -hmm. um, those dates are typically about peak. Freshness as deemed by the manufacturer, mm -hmm. but a lot of people are um, Not aware of that and think it's about safety and I cannot fault them for that if they're concerned that eating that product is going to make them sick mm -hmm. I can't fault them for that. That's the the very sticky perception that a lot of people have yeah. so You know, we like to say there's there's a common saying uh, look smell taste don't waste um, but it's really just like give that date label a second thought give it a try before you toss it right. It's a really big contributor and it leads to needless waste and I think You know, especially in households that are food insecure You know those people are just as susceptible to the perception that the food isn't safe as anybody else mm -hmm. And those households really cannot afford to be tossing that True. food and it's a lot of food is needlessly wasted um, yeah. Because of date labels, so yeah, I think stopping and thinking is a key piece because even in our own household use, I can think of a couple of places where there was something in the can, I think it was a canned vegetable, it was a little past this date, but used in a casserole, it was fine. It may not have been good for a single serving, if you would, because it may not have looked the same, but mm -hmm. in a casserole with everything else, 
it was going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And even something like uh, the taco chips, you know, Totitos or whatever the brand was, you know, it was past the date and they may have been a little softer, but, you know, bake them a little bit, they're fresh mm -hmm. and made up. <laughs> mm -hmm. They were still fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it takes a little bit of all of those techniques. It takes a little bit of Creativity. A little bit of creativity, a little patience, a little time, and not everybody has that, mm -hmm. but where you have the space to sort of test new habits and try to build them into your routine, it can really have big impacts. And that study that looked at sort of the most effective ways to reduce waste at home also found that the average American household of four is wasting $1,500 a year through the food that they're wasting, yeah. which is not pennies. I mean, it's no. more than $100 a month. So right. for folks to just kind of change a few habits and, and reduce that can mm -hmm. have a size It's almost that. like with that number, if I turned to somebody and said, how would you like to get $100 a month? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't say no. Mm -hmm. They would say, yeah, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. And right. that now is the opening to, oh, really? Mm -hmm. That's all? Yeah. Yeah, and I think even for some folks, you know, a lot of you mentioned like compost and more and more towns are doing household curbside compost. I live mm -hmm. in Boston. We've we've got we were part of the pilot there and it's been great to have, but before that we paid to have our compost picked up. Right. Which is a funny thing to have your waste picked up, but yes. you know, a lot of people do it. And um, you know, if you if you're doing that and you're seeing perfectly good food going into your compost bin, you're not only wasting the money from that food being wasted, you're paying money for somebody to take it away. Yes. It really there's a real financial incentive there to not The waste. town did a pilot, and don't hold me to the numbers, but within the school lunch program, which kids, there's going to be some waste there, just <laughs> whatever. There is a lot of waste <laughs> in school food, yes. They implemented that, and there was some staggering numbers of waste removed from the trash stream. So we weren't paying to have it go to trash because we pay for the trash. And they were putting it at, to the compost side, and they were getting some money for that. So it was like, ooh, this, mm -hmm. if this is the pilot, let's, you know, let's broaden that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's a, it's a factor we think about a lot with our vendor partnerships as well. You know, I think we're, we're always trying to find the right ways to broach the topic of, like, why work with spoonfuls? What are the benefits to you as a grocery store? And the hauling costs are quite significant. These, sure. All of these grocers have to have their trash or their compost hauled, and they're paying for that. Meanwhile, we can come in and take, you know, we're not taking your trash and we're not taking food that should go in the compost, but all the perfectly good food that would be going into those places, we'll take that. And it's thousands of pounds, in some cases tens of thousands of pounds. That's a significant uh, cost savings um, for vendors as well. So for them, yeah. Yeah. And you're funded via grants? Yep, so uh, about half of our funding is grants. Um, and a little bit, uh, about 10% corporate donations. Sure. Um, about, tw I think it's something like 20% is uh, from our events. Our big, big kind of flagship fundraising event is Ultimate Tailgate. It's a great time and it's coming up soon in November. Okay. Um, but that's kind of our biggest flagship fundraising event. And we have a couple other smaller fundraising events. And then about a quarter of our funding is individual giving. Donations. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, grants is is the biggest the biggest piece. Mm -hmm. um, we we have a lot of really fantastic foundation partnerships across the state, and right. um, so yeah, it's it's but it's it's a very um, cost intensive work that we do. So it's it's really our grant funder is our grant writer is a very critical team member for yes. us. Yes, <laughs> yes. And then as you develop the relationships, and you got a partner here, they appreciate it. So then, mm -hmm. like through this, we can share the word, and hopefully more and more people will say, "Hey, uh, let me talk to Spookfields. Maybe they can help us here." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you, Steve, for allowing us to have this conversation and talk about this important topic. It it is uh, fun to do this as part of Hunger Action Month. It's really important to raise awareness around food insecurity how it relates to the climate emergency, to highlight partners um, that the Franklin Food Pantry has that allows us to do this important work. Um, there are some specific items we've talked about today that you can do at home, but it is worth mentioning the Franklin Food Pantry is open 365 days a year, just about, and um, you, we are always open to volunteers. Um, youth groups, civic groups who might want to participate and support us, and of course, monetary donations. 
Um, we have a couple of events coming up. We have our turkey trot that is um, really sort of a, a banner event, um, and that's on uh, Thanksgiving Day, which is a really family fun event. And of course, our website has links if you are a business and you want to get involved or an individual who wants um, to get involved and donate, um, we would be honored and humbled to have that support. So. And Liz, thanks for taking time today to share the story. Uh, mm -hmm. We should come back at some point when there's additional developments or you're doing newer things <laughs> with the pantry or just in the area that we should be aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I'll be very happy to come back anytime. This has been really great. I'm looking forward to uh, talking more about this. Uh, if folks want to learn more about us, they can visit spoonfuls.org. Um, you know, as we talked about earlier, we've got sort of expansion and st strategic activities on our horizon. So, you know, mm -hmm. there's there's more to come from Spoonfuls. So spoonfuls.org is a great way to uh, learn about what we've been up to. And um, yeah, our big fundraising event is coming up November 3rd, the Ultimate Tailgate. So we'll be very glad to have folks join us there. It is a good time, delicious food. I highly it's recommend joining. It's a season for tailgate. Mm. <laughs> yes, it is. It is, absolutely, yep. And it, it should be a, a great event on November 3rd. So, um, yeah, but love to hear from anyone through our website, spoonfuls.org, our contact form Franklin there is a great TV way to get in touch. And Franklin well, thank you again, both Tina and Liz. And again, quick reminder to the listeners, thank you for listening, and we do this because Franklin How can you matters. If you can use the information that you find here, please tell your friends and neighbors. If you don't like something here, please let me know. Through this feedback loop, we can continue to make improvements. And I thank you for listening. For additional information, please visit franklinmatters.org. If you have questions or comments, you can reach me directly at suresteve at gmail.com. The music for the intro and exit was provided by Michael Clark and the group East of Shirley. The piece is titled Ernesto Manana, copyright Michael Clark and Tin Type Tunes in 2008 and used with their permission. I hope you enjoy. And by the way, you can also subscribe and listen to Franklin Matters Radio on your favorite podcast app. Search in podcasts for Franklin Matters.